This is about nature, and I want to introduce you to Mel Hattie. Mel, um, say something to the crowd. Hi, Melissa Hattie. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mel, your PhD is on? My PhD was about connection with nature. So it was a partnership with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, um, looking at uh, how to nurture connection with nature and our uh, different types of relationships that we have with nature. So that's what I'll be talking about tonight. We're going to hit the polling and I hope this works. Are humans part of nature? Okay. 10% of the room probably shouldn't be here. No, that's not right. Because it's a really interesting question, and many of you answered the question to say, yes, I think humans are part of nature, but the decision you make about whether humans are part of nature affects your behaviour toward nature. And about. And about nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a word cloud. What comes to mind when you think about nature? So this is basically, you type a word, you hit submit, and the word cloud will appear. Trees, plants, green, animals, dirt. Overrated. Overrated. I wow. like it. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. We'll find out who it is. <laughs> so it's a great kind of word cloud to kick everything off. What about this? Are these things nature as well? Is coronavirus nature? Yep. Is flooding nature and climate change nature? So the reason we ask about this is often when we think about nature, we think about pretty things, beautiful things. We think about trees or animals or plants or forests. Oftentimes we don't think about stuff that's bad, but this stuff is nature as well. And part of my research was looking at what actually is nature? And one of the questions that came up a lot was, are things like bushfires and floods and coronavirus nature? All right, we're gonna get you to rate on your sliding scale on your phone where you sit when it comes to nature and these two kind of extremes. So each of these words has an extreme on the scale. Is it dangerous and safe, beautiful or disgusting, fascinating or boring, peaceful or scary? Where do you sit on the scale of nature? And this is particularly interesting when you think about how you have experienced nature in the past. So if you've had experiences of nature that are dangerous, you might've got lost in the forest, you're probably more likely to think about nature as somewhere dangerous. Whereas if you think about it as somewhere safe, like if you're in an urban park, your perception of nature is going to be different. I just want to find the person, they not only find it beautiful and fascinating, it's so beautiful it's off the scale. <laughs> <laughs> All right, connection with nature. Step us through that. So the reason I, or we got you to think about this stuff is we have this idea of connection with nature, which is kind of our relationship with nature. And our, as humans, we relate to nature in lots of different ways. So we have thoughts about nature. And we might think about nature in terms of it's something beautiful or it's something that needs protecting. Or we might think about nature as something that's a resource that's there to be used, to extract it, to be taken from. We might think about nature in terms of emotions. So that idea of you're very emotionally attached to a place. You've got a favorite park or a favorite location and you go, wow, I love that place. I really want to go there. Or you might, again, if you've had a really bad experience, you got dumped in a wave at the beach, you might go, mm, yeah, that emotional experience is, oh, no, I don't want to go there. With experiences themselves, actually spending time in nature. And again, the same thing. If you've had a really positive experience, if you're drawn to spend time in nature, then your experiences will be about get out there and go do it. Whereas if you've had uh, experiences in nature or you've maybe have a, an upbringing where you haven't had exposure to nature, you might not want to spend time in nature. Those experiences will be very different. And all of these things tie into this idea of our, our relationship with nature, different types of relationships with nature. And connection with nature as a concept is interesting because it's useful for health and well-being. We know that people that spend more time in nature that are more connected to nature tend to have better psychological well-being, less stress, better physical health. It's been associated with lower blood pressure. It's been associated with things like lesser heart disease and those kinds of things. But it's also important for conservation and protecting nature. So we know that people who are more connected to nature do more to protect nature. So this idea of uh, connection with nature was a really interesting thing that I was really fascinated with and the central part of my PhD. But the question that came up was, if we're connecting to nature, what exactly are we connecting to? And so this question of what is nature was one of the things that I focused on in my research. And I asked, well, we asked 3,000 odd people the same question that we just asked you. What comes to mind when you think about nature? 
And we categorise these. I categorise these into um, coding and did all sorts of stats on them and, and came up with sort of three categories and then a complex category was a combination. So the descriptive category is about labels for things. It's about a tree or it's about a forest or it's about a beach. It's the simple, this is what nature is. The normative category was about ecosystems, balance, things that need protection, that kind of idea of, you know, it's a very pr uh, precious, fragile kind of ecosystem, biodiversity type construct. The experiential category were the people that said physical experiences like hiking, camping, fishing, walking, those kinds of things, but also experiences in the sense of emotional experiences. So people that describe nature as beautiful, or tranquil, or wow, or that kind of, you know, wonderful kind of positive experience. Or gaga. Or gaga. Yeah. Or gaga. Yeah. So these are different ways of experiencing nature and describing nature. And I think all of these categories were shown in the word cloud in different forms. Absolutely. And it was really great to see those words. Not only was it a tree and a forest and a beach, there were things like gaga and awe and beauty and tranquility and calm. All of those things that came up. And ecosystems and connectedness. So depending yeah. on how we look at nature, it affects our behaviour and our response to it. Absolutely. And how we categorise. Absolutely. Yeah. And the complex category was a combination of all the others. So that was a richer picture. Some people that might have said nature is a tree, but it's also beautiful. So this whole more of a richer description. And um, this is purely on a pop culture description of nature. Um, what is the, traditionally in fairy stories the scariest place? In fairy stories. The forest, the deep, dark forest. Yep. And yet, that is the place that we would go to say, if you were taking a photo of nature, that's what it would be. Yeah. So it, it can coexist as a place of danger that we're worried about and also the place that we want to be and find as well. And this is what's so interesting about this idea of what is nature because it's something that can be dangerous and beautiful all at once. And it's different things to different people and it means so many different things. Nature is not a thing. Nature is an amorphous kind of construct. So when I had a look at these ideas of concepts of nature, these different descriptions, these four categories, and how do these different descriptions of nature match up with this idea of connection with nature? So do people think about nature in a certain way? And that is also related to their relationship with nature. And what I found was people that describe nature just in descriptive terms, it's a tree, it's a forest, it's an animal. They had much lower connection. They didn't have a stronger relationship with nature. Whereas the people who describe nature in the more experiential and complex terms, the richer kind of picture about nature is beautiful and wonderful and all of those extra kind of, you know, more descriptors, had a much higher connection with nature. And your work is also looking at moving categories and getting people to, to change how they describe and connect to nature? A lot of what we're trying to do with DELP is to get people to be more connected, so right. to spend more time in nature to actually nurture that bond with nature because, again, connection with nature is so important for not only health and well-being but conservation. Connection, uh, the concepts of nature categories were also related to conservation behaviours. So I looked at these conservation behaviours are things like environmental volunteering, citizen science, uh, picking up rubbish in a public space. And I found that people, again, describe nature in descriptive ways, didn't pick up litter, didn't do conservation type behaviours. They weren't as engaged in that conservation process. Whereas people that describe nature as experiences, like this little person down here looking at a feather going, wow, these people were more likely to pick up litter or more likely to plant a tree or more likely to do some gardening in order to look after nature. All right, implications. So what does all this mean? Uh, increasing connection with nature, as I mentioned, is good for not only health and well-being, but also conservation. If we want to look after the planet, we need to get people more connected, more nurturing those relationships with nature. And one way to potentially do this is through this idea of how we think about nature. So if we can encourage people to think about nature in terms of activities, so nature isn't just a tree. Nature is a tree that you can sit under and talk to a friend and go, wow. Or beauty and colours and textures and shapes as opposed to just it's a rock on the ground or it's just a beach. Or if we get them, if we can encourage people to think about tranquility, you know, to sort of think about when you go out into nature, when you're sitting under that tree and you're enjoying the sun on your face, you're like, yeah, that's pretty cool. And emotions. Emotions are a really big important one as well. So again, getting people to think about what's that emotional experience of nature. Um, how, do, how do we sell four-wheel drives in Australia when it comes to nature? What, what are the images of four-wheel drives? Is it quietly camping by the side of the road? A few of them. Most of them are punching through nature in a way, aren't they? They're sort of exploding through, trampling over, 
or diving into and exploding out of. And these are people that will never actually use the car for that purpose at all. But it's this collective delusion that we are outdoorsy kind of individuals that buy large machines that punch through nature. Where in fact, if we scratch it, we take it, we panic over this and we wax the car. But that is still the kind of collective delusion, isn't it? Nature is something that you have to dominate or mm. drive over or mm. something. And it's interesting now that probably as they sell different types of cars to a different demographic, they will show people in nature, not necessarily squashing it, running through it, but actually being in it. Yeah. And this all comes back to that original question we asked you about, are humans part of nature or not? So this, what Jeff just described, is that idea about humans are separate from, we're, we're not part of nature, so we can kind of do anything we want to it, which is a very common perception in a lot of our Western kind of society. So Mel uh, is now going to facilitate a sensory experience. Mm. And for this to work, um, on that side of the room, you'll see a fruit box there. What I'd like you to do is to uh, take something out of the box and pass it on. And, and there's a couple of boxes on that side. On well. that side. Yep. We want you to reach in. It's all been hygienically, what well, none of it has actually, but it's all natural. <laughs> Um, so uh, there'll be a bunch of items in there. Just grab anything at random. We want to illustrate to you this idea about actively engaging with nature. So what we have in this box is bits of nature. I can see people rifling through going, oh, damn, I wanted the flower. She's got it. All right, Mel. Um, so what I would like to invite you now is to have a look at what you've got in your hand. Just have a look. Notice what you can see in terms of colours different shapes, different textures. Can you see any shadows? New growth. New growth, there you go. If you've got a, a leaf, you might turn it over and look at the veins on the back of it. And as you're doing this, you might want to rub your fingers across it very gently. See if you can notice different textures. If you've got a flower, the petals might be smooth while the center part of it might be a little bit rough. If you've got a leaf, you might notice the stem is a different texture to the actual leaf itself. And as you're doing that, absolutely, hold it up to your nose and seeing if you can smell something. Us humans have a very strong relationship between that scent and memories. Um, the way that it operates in the brain is very close together. So when, a, when we have a memory of something, it's often associated with a smell. And if we smell, then that can evoke that memory. So what I'm encouraging you to do here is to actively engage with nature. And part of the process of nurturing connection with nature and nurturing our relationship with nature is getting us to kind of stop and slow down and to notice. Notice what you feel, notice what you see, notice the emotions that it brings up. It's all totally kind of the fine. natural experience. It's a natural experience. Yeah. Um, notice the emotional experiences that you have. If you're sitting here in this room and you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable going, just get on with it, well, that's an emotional experience as well. Let's work with that. All right. Can we actually experience nature in a world of devices? Most of us are using our devices. We're using our devices now. There's a bunch of electronica making this event work. How does that work? This is something that comes up a lot, actually. In, in We often think about if we're in nature, we can't. It's almost like the two things are mutually exclusive. If we're in nature, we can't be on a device and vice versa. But there's a lot of research happening now that shows you can actually use devices to make people engage with nature, to actually encourage that type of stuff. So is this, what was this? This is Pokemon. Pokemon, Pokemon Go. So people remember the Pokemon Go experience. So this was a way of people suddenly finding an excuse to get out there and geocaching and all of that sort of stuff. So it was a way of experiencing nature, but you had to have the device with you. And actually encouraging people to do it. And there's lots of ways that this is happening. So um, frog census. I know my mum does the frog census every year on her property where she listens for the frog and records it and uploads it as a citizen science project. That's a way of using technology to encourage engaging with nature. And there's other sorts of ways as well. In the UK, they have this annual program uh, for the month of June in their summer, they call 30 Days Wild. And they encourage people to get outside and to do random acts of wildness, which might be anything from go for a walk, pick a leaf, draw a picture, take a photo, anything that involves nature, and then encourage people to log that on the app. And so you can actually keep your phone as a, as a way of recording what you've actually done. So, Technology doesn't have to be something that prevents us from being in nature. Technology can actually be a way of helping us. And it's a, it's a nuanced argument, of course, because there are parts of the world where uh, there are rock formations or beaches, for instance, for instance, where people go to have a selfie taken. 
and that's the point of the destination. Well, like the photos in the canola fields at the moment that yeah, the right. farmers are cracking oh, right. about. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. people are getting into canola fields, they're taking selfies. Um, th this idea that um, it is nature, but it only exists because I took a photo of it and I've been able to upload it. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that just part of the whole behaviour change thing with devices and the way we share our experiences these days? And at what point will we have to say, put the phone down, put the device down, you can just experience nature without all of that mm. sort of stuff. Mm. It's kind of hard because if you if it was pitched originally on the internet, they'd say that's how I first heard about this. Sort of well, thing. and the interesting paradox, a lot of these remote locations in various countries, once upon a time people never went to because they didn't know they existed. But in this age of Instagram now, everyone's suddenly flocking to this location. Mm. There was a really great article in The Guardian recently of this someone that had taken all of these photos of all of these people at these famous locations and pulled them all in together and there was this massive crowd of people on this supposedly pristine beach. It's fascinating. Which leads to the question, are humans part of nature or outside of mm. nature looking at it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wilderness versus gardens, nature is everywhere if we pay attention to it. What does that mean? When we think about nature, coming back to that idea of that question, what comes to mind when you think about nature, we often think that we have to go somewhere to experience nature. We often think about nature as wilderness. When I, when I looked at that coding of, of all of the categories, the word wilderness actually belonged in the experiential category. So people were associating this idea of wilderness as, as you do something. Yeah? Um, but the idea of this is you don't have to go a long way to see nature. Nature's right there. Mm. Nature's here. Nature's at your front door. Nature's pot plants. Nature is what you've got in your hand. And I think we, we need to try to work on this idea about getting people to kind of go, actually, no, nature is here. I don't have to have nature out there. Nature is part of me. It's part of us. It's part of our existence. We depend on it for survival. And, and getting people to appreciate this intimate relationship that we have with nature, I think, is the key to kind of connecting and then getting more people to protect nature. And yet we sometimes measure the authenticity of the natural experience by how many days it took to get there, how many hours walking, mm. the tent that you put up, the food that you packed, all of that sort of stuff is a kind of self-sacrifice to enjoy nature. Yeah. But in fact, it can be all around us. Absolutely. It can be a walk through a garden like this to get to work from the, the train station. It can be a nature strip. So what are the takeaways for everyone? So... I guess the number one thing is nature is good for us. Nature is good for us in so many ways. We need to interact with it. We need to appreciate it. We need to, to stop and slow down and, and notice it. It's good for our physical health. It's good for our mental health. It's good for us actually doing things to get out and protect nature. And nature is everywhere. So thinking about nature as that little blade of grass or that fly that's buzzing around me right now. Mm -hmm. All of those things are important parts of nature that we need to think about and we need to start connecting with because that's what's going to help nurture our relationship with nature and wanting to spend more time in it and wanting to notice that emotional experience. And so that idea about what we did before, I tried to get you to do, of, of reflecting and actively engaging. When you walk back to your cars and the trams and the trains to go home, if it's still daylight, I would encourage you to have a look in the park and just stop for a second and see if you can notice three different trees or see if you can notice different shapes or different colours or different textures. And to just think, when was the last time I was in this park? What does it remind me of and how do I feel? And is this actually a pleasant experience? And then go on your merry way to get on your technology to go home. Okay. Yep. Um, look, I think uh, we are drawing to a close, but I just wanted to say a big round of applause for Mel, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. It was a great venue. It's a lovely, lovely part of Melbourne and quite a surprise, quite a treat. So thank you very much.